Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third of the fall 2020 IC lecture series, Where Stuff Come From, from Earth's Resources and Sustainability. We're so excited to continue this. This is our uh, third installment of this lecture series. Uh, the topics in, the, in previous uh, months were building stuff, materials from the earth that sustain our built environment from ancient coral to city sidewalks. And then in October, after that September one, we had in October precious stuff, the discovery, extraction, and use of valuable, valuable minerals from gems to smartphones. And uh, we're just very excited to have uh, Emeritus Professor Stephen Marshak back again for this third talk, this one burning stuff fossil fuels, consuming the life of the past to power life of the present. And so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Marshak, who has been on the faculty at the U of I for 35 years, served as geology department head and as director of the School of Earth Society and Environment. Uh, his research in structural geology and tectonics and his interest in geologic photography have taken him to all seven continents. We're very excited to have him here. Professor Marshak. Hi, good morning or afternoon. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to chat with you for this last one of this um, series of lectures. <clears throat> Today, what I'm gonna be talking primarily on are uh, fossil fuels and trying to understand where they come from, some of the sustainability issues related to them and uh, some of the, the issues that we're gonna be facing in the future. And also in there, try to talk a little bit about why we're still so dependent on them after we realize the issues that are associated with them. So um, let's start by, by just saying what I'm gonna be covering today. Uh, after giving a bit of introduction to what fossil fuels are and what the sustainability issues are, I'm gonna focus on, on the two main ones. I'm gonna start by talking about coal, and then I'm gonna to turn to hydrocarbons, which includes oil and natural gas. And the final part will be focused on some of the more recent developments related to hydrocarbons, particularly the issue of fracking and why it's done and, and, and what it involves. So um, let's start with the, the basic question of why sustainability of energy is an issue. And actually a, a number of different factors. First of all, of course, is population growth. Um, the world's population has increased dramatically over the last uh, couple hundred years, and people now use energy. And that's because um, we're using energy on an individual basis at a much greater rate than, than in the past. Um, if you just sort of define one human power as the amount of energy that a person in prehistory would have used in a given day, about the same as a 75 watt light bulb, we're now using 300 times that amount uh, per person. And that's in order to sustain our, our built environment, the transportation that takes us there, and of course, uh, maintain temperatures in buildings and, and operate industry. So it's really uh, quite a change since the past. The other thing is that, that to some extent, some of the resources that we've been using for energy are being depleted. And so therefore we have to distinguish between renewable resources, ones that can be regrown or replaced on the time scale of decades to centuries versus non-renewable resources um, where the, repl re the replacement would take centuries to millennia to millions of years. And many of the energy supplies that we're using are, are non-renewable in the time context of, of human society. And finally, of course, there, there are the issues related to the environment and to climate change. Um, clearly, as everybody's probably aware, burning fossil fuels and extraction of fossil fuels produces pollutants, produces waste, and of course produces greenhouse gases. So there, there are a number of issues involved in these. Now, if you think about um, energy use patterns over time, we see that, that you know, prior to, uh, to civilization in any form, um, or just think about any other animal, all they need is the food that they eat for fuel. And basically until, um, oh gosh, 100,000, 200,000 years ago, that's the same story could be made for people. We just needed the food that we needed. But once people began to use fire, began to cook, began to warm um, dwellings, obviously they needed some external sources of, of fuel. And early fuel um, obviously was wood, um, maybe less familiar is dung, which is still used in some societies um, in certain parts of the world, peat, which is basically compacted, partially decayed organic matter from the past, which when dried out will still burn. Um, and basically what, what this kind of fuel is, is just simply reversing the process of, of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis absorbs solar energy, uh, 
combines with car takes carbon dioxide and water and builds sugars and from that other kinds of organic chemicals um, and releases oxygen. Combustion, the burning of, of organic matter, is effectively the reverse of that process. You take sugar or some sort of equivalent, combine it with oxygen in a chemical reaction, oxidation reaction that produces carbon dioxide and water, and of course, also heat and light, which is why we do it. So it's basically just the reverse. Now, as energy usage grew and as population grew, um, the key source that people used, especially in, in uh, European countries, Western society, um, was wood. And so people basically chopped down the forests of, of Europe. And uh, maps that show the progression of deforestation are, are pretty dramatic. A thousand BC, much of Europe was forested. By a 2000 years later, not so much. And by the, the, the start of the industrial revolution, a lot of the forests had been cut down entirely. So without forests and with increasing demand for, for energy, people began to switch to fossil fuel, to other sources of fuel. And obviously the, the easiest one to get at because it's exposed in some places right at the surface of the earth was coal. So in the early days of steam energy, where factories were run by steam power and trains were run by steam power, people were using increasing amounts of coal to power this, this energy. In other words, there was a transition to fossil fuel. So what is a fossil fuel? Well, it's basically a material that stores solar energy that came to earth in the past. That solar energy is trapped by photosynthesis in, in biological materials. But what's different, instead of burning the biological materials directly, in the case of fossil fuels, those biological materials are buried and transformed into some sort of fuel that is stored underground for millions to hundreds of millions of years. We use three types in particular, coal, which consists of solid carbon primarily, oil, which is liquid hydrocarbons, and natural gas, which are gaseous hydrocarbons. We'll see that, that coal and, and oil and gas come from different sources. Uh, coal comes primarily from plant matter, and hydrocarbons come primarily from plankton and algae. So let's uh, look quickly at, at how this change has been manifested in terms of where we get our energy from. Uh, you look at a graph of energy use over time, and since the middle of the 19th century, it's grown effectively exponentially. Um, the original biological fuels, wood, peat, and dung, now account for hardly any of our supply. Most of it comes from coal or hydrocarbons. In other words, even now, and this graph is a little bit out of date already, but even now, we're still primarily dependent on fossil fuel for our energy resources. You can see it again in this, in this pie chart. Natural gas and oil a few years ago was counting for over 60% of our energy usage. Okay, let's turn our attention to coal, which was the first fossil fuel to be used. We're gonna talk about coal and its formation, where coal reserves are, how it's extracted and used, and some of the consequences of, of extracting and using it. So first of all, <clears throat> coal is like any other sedimentary rock, a material that's laid down um, in layers in the geologic past. Uh, you will find coal in beds, which are called seams, that are interlayered with other kinds of sedimentary rocks, such as shale or sandstone. Now, when you dig it out of the ground, it breaks up into chunks. That's because coal contains natural fra fractures, which for some reason are called cleat. So when you take it out, it's each layer is bounded on top and bottom by a bedding plane, and then uh, by perpendicular fractures, and so it breaks into these chunky blocks, which is what our usual impression of coal tends to look like. But if you look closely at coal, especially on the bedding planes, you'll see that there are often fossil plants associated with this. That's the evidence that coal comes from fossil plants, fossil ferns, fossil club mosses, all sorts of other kinds of woody material. And if you look under a microscope, you can see that coal contains effectively a cell structure, like any other kind of plant, except now this is fossilized. So basically the formation of coal is effectively a reaction where there's chemical alteration of buried organic matter that consists of a lot of cellulose and other kinds of, of plant material over time. And the trick is that what happens is that when coal gets buried and, um, or I should say when organic matter gets buried in a way that it does not decay completely. In other words, it gets buried in a relatively oxygen-free environment, so it does not oxidize and doesn't get eaten up by bacteria and other organisms. It'll get compacted and dewatered, and as it gets buried deeper and deeper, it becomes 
warmed up. And as it warms up, chemical reactions take place that remove chemicals such as hydrogen and nitrogen and oxygen and leave behind a concentration of carbon. So in coal, there are very complicated cell or complicated large molecules called cold macerals. They can be made of vitronite, which is basically from cellulose, or liptonite, which comes from leaves and pollen. Complicated molecular structures. Now, why do we get these layers of coal that extend over large areas? Well, you can imagine an environment where, where there's a, a shallow sea that's encroaching on the land. And a sea level rise, as you go just inshore of land, in the right kind of climate, meaning a, a warm environment where there's a lot of, of uh, or high water table, um, you'll get a coal swamp. But over time, the debris that's getting buried in that coal swamp gets buried progressively by first sand and then deeper water sediment. So sea level rises, eventually the, the environment where coal is being deposited is migrating inland and marine environments are burying it. So you end up with this broad layer of coal, coal seam. Now, as I mentioned, over time, in the right kind of environment, in other words, an environment where the floor of the basin is being is undergoing subsidence or sinking, gradually the coal gets compacted deeper and deeper. And as that happens, first it transforms into brown coal, and then eventually it gets transformed into black coal. Um, all the while, gases, methane, ammonia, other gases are being released so that you're ending up with a compacted solid mass of coal or carbon. Now, uh, geologists tend to separate coal into different ranks depending on how much that reaction has gone forward. So lignite is the brown coal that forms at relatively low temperatures, only about 30% carbon. Bituminous, which is the kind of coal that occurs in Illinois, forms at higher temperatures, 100, 200 degrees, it's about 60% carbon. And near mountain belts, um, you can get anthracite coal, which forms at even higher temperatures that gets up to 80 or 90% carbon. Now, this percentage of carbon is important because the percent of carbon de determines how much energy is released per pound of coal. So anthracite releases more energy than lignite, and bituminous is somewhere in between. Well, when did the coal that we have in Illinois and other parts of the country come from? Well, two primary periods of time. Most Illinois coal or all Illinois coal was deposited as a layer of sediment during the Carboniferous, a period that subdivided by geologists into Mississippian and Pennsylvanian time, um, you know, over 300 million years ago. In Wyoming, another key source of coal, uh, it's younger. It's, it's only about 70 or 80 million years. Now, oops, I'm sorry, went the wrong direction. If you go back to the Carboniferous, you see that the plants that are turning into coal are not plants that we see today. It's not like we're taking a modern forest and burying it, or even a modern swamp and burying it. There were different plants back then because it was a few hundred million years ago. And interestingly, um, there were obviously different organisms. There were giant dragonflies at the time. These things were, were phenomenal. They, they had wingspans of a meter. You might wonder, well, why don't we have them today? Well, insects are actually not very good at, at uh, processing oxygen. So um, you can only get really large insects if you've got a lot of oxygen. And if you think about those coal swamps that were generating huge amounts of oxygen through photosynthesis, there's actually was a higher degree of oxygen during the Carboniferous. And because of that, you could have larger insects like giant dragonflies. You'll notice it stops at about 35%. That's because if you have more than about 35% oxygen in the atmosphere, you would have flash fires. The forests would become so combustible that they would completely burn up. So there's basically a limit to the amount of oxygen that we could have in the, in the atmosphere. Right now, we're down back at around 21%. So where does coal occur? Well, it occurs in places where there is subsidence of sedimentary basins that allowed for the accumulation of significant amounts of, of, of plant debris and burial, and therefore transformation into coal. And you can see that there are these big areas of, of uh, bituminous coal in the central part of the country. Anthracite is pretty localized in the Appalachian Mountains and lignites out here in the west. Um, why is there so much in that part of the world, in our part of the world? Well, you have to go to a paleogeographic map to see what the Earth looked like at 300 million years ago. It didn't look like it did today because 300 million years ago, there was a supercontinent called Pangaea, and North America was attached to Africa and South America with a mountain range in between, the, what was the active Appalachian Mountains at the time. 
And Illinois, which would be right about where that dot was, and the rest of Central North America was pretty much in an equatorial climate. And because of that, it was pretty hot, very good environment for forming swamps. Just think of the rainforest of, of uh, equatorial Brazil today. So Illinois was in a, on the edge of a shallow sea in an equatorial swamp, a very good environment where you could have a lot of rainfall, very high water table, and a lot of coal, uh, coal forming plants growing that could be buried because the Illinois region was undergoing subsidence sinking to form the Illinois basin. That means that if, if you look beneath the, the flat plains of Illinois, you know, the view that you see taken off from uh, Willard Airport back when there were airplanes flying out of Willard Airport, um, you'd see something that actually was not that dissimilar from the Grand Canyon, layers of strata that go down to a Precambrian basement underneath. In fact, if you look at the stratigraphic column, the succession of layers of geologic formations in, in the Illinois basin, the region beneath us, you see that the Carboniferous, the youngest strata, contain many seams of coal. So if you look at the geologic map of Illinois based on work by the Illinois State Geological Survey, you can see that there's sort of a bullseye structure. That's because the central part of the basin sank and accumulated particularly thick accumulations of sediment with the Carboniferous strata that contains coal out in this part. Let's turn that map on its side and draw a cross section through it, a vertical slice. And this is what it would look like, vertically exaggerated. And here's the coal. I, I'm hoping that you're seeing my, my pointer here, but here's the coal in the upper part, the base of this green unit at the top of that cross section. Coal seams are about there. And where that coal comes close to the surface, that's where the mines are. If you dug deep enough, you could get the coal all the way underneath the central part of the basin, but it'd be too expensive to get it. So here's a, again a map of, of the Illinois Basin, and on the left is a map showing the distribution of coal, coal mines, both underground and surface. And you can see that they're basically stratigraphically controlled. They occur around the, the central part of the Illinois Basin, where there's coal that not only has formed, but is also relatively near to the surface. Around the world, similar stories. There are coal deposits on all continents, formed in similar environments to the ones that occur in Illinois. Now, coal consumption, until relatively recently, has been growing primarily, not so much due to uh, growth of consumption in industrialized countries like uh, Western Europe and, and North America, but rather due to the industrializing countries, primarily China and India, where to keep pace with the growing demands for power, power plants were being built at a point in China at a rate of one per week. Now that's changed in recent years because natural gas, because of fracking, has become much more economical and therefore cheaper. And so primarily due to competition from natural gas, uh, coal consumption has decreased. And then of course there's, there's also concern because of climate, but it's actually the price primarily that's led to a, an 18 and now even more decrease in coal production, at least in the United States. So how's coal produced? Well, obviously from mining. Back in the 19th century, in the upper left, you can see the traditional image of a mine with miners with pickaxes and uh, horse-drawn carts pulling them out from underground. Nowadays, we still use mines that are underground, such as the one in the lower left, but we also do a lot of mining um, at the surface, open pit mining. Let's look first at underground methods. Um, basically, underground mining is used whenever the coal seam is too deep to extract or remove all the rock above it, so instead it's cheaper to either dig a, a sloping tunnel down or to de dig a vertical elevator and then mine using specialized equipment underground. You can see some of these, these specialized mining equipment, these grinders that grind away at the, at the rock underground to get at the coal. Um, it comes up in elevators and then it's piled up. Um, and this is what a, the top of a modern coal mine looks like. Um, surface mining techniques or, or strip mining techniques are different. In strip mining techniques, you're going at, the miners are going after coal that's close enough that it's cheaper to just remove the overburden. The rock above is in the upper left-hand corner, the sandstone that's above this, the coal, and then just start digging out the coal. Uh, sometimes that's done in a, in a, in a trench-like mine. Sometimes uh, people auger into the side of a mine. And in West Virginia, unfortunately, um, there's a lot of mountain-type mining where they just take off the top of the mountain to get a layer of coal that's fairly close to the top. Um, this is the basic operation. 
the, the coal is, is a, a big machine called a drag haul, strips out a ditch, uh, removes the waste rock, and then a, a, a power shovel digs out the, shovel, the coal underneath, loads it into trucks and takes it to the processing plant. So this is an, uh, what a modern Wyoming trench mine looks like. Basically, the mine is this area, the active mine is this area here. It's mining into this landscape, leaving behind tailings behind it. So even though this whole area on the right was once mined, the only active part of the mine is this narrow trench. Um, the drag halls that are used in these mines are absolutely immense. Uh, this is a, a large bulldozer over here. And you can see that this dwarfs a large bulldozer. A person is about the height of that little door right there. So these are immense mines that just drag along with a gigantic shovel, holds about as much as a two car garage and dumps it um, and moves it out of the way so that then the shovels can dig the coal and pile it into trucks to take it into the um, processing plant, which looks something like this, um, or actually not like this. It, it, this is eventually then transported by train to a power plant. And so this is a, a, a relatively modern coal burning, burning power plant. Until recently, uh, electricity generation was about 68% of the, of the coal usage. Industry and other usage was the remainder. These percentages are changing um, as natural gas is gradually replacing coal for power generation. Now, the basic way one of these power plants works is effectively you feed the fuel into a boiler, uh, a furnace. The furnace heats water that comes in. The water turns to steam. The steam drives a high pressure turbine. Um, then it gets recondensed and used again. And then that turbine turns a generator, which then produces electricity that's carried away in transmission lines. Fairly simple process. Problem, of course, is that burning coal produces a lot of stuff besides um, energy. It produces carbon dioxide, of course, methane, uh, water vapor, all sorts of other chemicals, nitrous oxide, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide. And because coal is not pure carbon, but contains other components in it, um, it actually produces mercury and uranium and arsenic, things that aren't too great to put into the atmosphere. To try to deal with this stuff and, and decrease the problem, modern coal power burning, modern, excuse me, modern coal burning power plants use scrubbers to filter out and take out the particulates. Um, they use a mist of water and limestone to precipitate out the sulfur and turn it into gypsum um, and other techniques. So it's not as bad as it once was, but it still produces some particulates, uh, some gases, and, and quite a bit of carbon dioxide. Now, let's zoom in on one aspect of it. Coal um, contains sulfur because when the sediments were originally deposited, there was, were sulfur containing uh, components in the, in the plant material. In the underground environment where coals turn into coal, that sulfur turns into pyrite or fool's gold. It's basically an iron sulfide mineral. And that's the source of sulfur in coal. So when you crush coal and grind it up and put it into a power plant um, and burn it, that sulfur comes out as a gas and then it turns into um, an aqueous solution of sulfuric acid. And that sulfuric acid is what makes acid rain. So the burning of coal in the central part of the United States, uh, not as a little bit less of a problem now, but still a problem, produces acidic rain, which then falls on the eastern part of the country, turning lakes and swamps and other things into an acidic solution, which isn't great for some of the organisms and plants that grow there or the fish that swim in the water. Also, when coal is exposed in a, in a mine, um, that sulfur, which was in pyrite in reduced form, oxidizes and gets dissolved in water and starts producing acid mine runoff. So the fluids, the groundwater that passes through a mine and then comes out of a mine um, can be very, very acidic. And that acidic uh, groundwater causes rust, but it also uh, causes populations of, of bacteria and archaea to grow, which uh, give the, the water this color to some extent. And then there's a, another aspect that's a problem from, from uh, power plants. And that is that when you burn the coal, uh, again, it, it's not 100% carbon. There are other components in the coal, and that stuff doesn't burn, gets left beha behind as ash. That'll come from clay and silica and other minerals that are in the coal. That ash can't be flushed down the toilet, so it's got to be stored somehow. So it gets stored in retention ponds. There's a giant retention pond associated with this coal burning power plant. 
Problem is that sometimes those become unstable and more than once the retaining walls that have held back these retention ponds have, have, uh, have been breached. And when that happens, the sludge, all this noxious coal burning ash, which or coal ash, which contains not just um, ash in the sense of <clears throat> like wood ash, but also um, fairly dangerous chemicals gets washed down. Fortunately, uh, when this happened not too long ago in, in Tennessee, <clears throat> the result was not so much, uh, obviously destroyed a lot of property, didn't injure the population so much, they were able to get away, but the workers who cleaned it up were exposed to deadly chemicals and it was a huge problem after the fact. Take a drink for a second. Now, another thing that's <clears throat> a little bit less well known is that uh, coal underground can sometimes catch on fire, sometimes intentionally, sometimes accidentally, but once these fires get going, they're virtually impossible to put out. So in many parts of the world, there are extreme coal bed fires. Um, the worst are in China at the moment, but there's also one that's been burning for decades in Centralia, Pennsylvania. Um, the, the gases produced by that fire seep out, create noxious gases, means that basically the whole town had to be moved. And uh, it looked like this on the left in, in 1970. Today, nobody lives there because basically the, the gases are, are, are not something that you want to live in. Now, <clears throat> you may have heard of clean coal. And basically what that refers to is a process of trying to convert coal into a fuel that burns cleanly. And that process is called coal gasification. Basic gist of it is you mix coal, uh, mill it, mix it with water, put it into a furnace and, and heat it at temperatures that are not gonna combust it. That produces gases that can then be processed first by scrubbing out the particulates, then by removing deadly chemicals like mercury, and then by, by uh, cleaning it up to remove the bad stuff. So you're ending up with basically just uh, a, a fuel that consists primarily of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. That's called syngas. Now syngas can either be converted into chemicals or by various more complicated reactions can be converted into hydrocarbons that can be burned as fuel. This, this is actually you know, pretty good. You're able to get all the bad stuff out before it burns. So you don't have the problem of sulfur smoke and particulates and so forth. But the downside of it is that it requires a lot of energy. So it's not necessarily economic. In fact, it's not economic, I don't think, at current prices, because again, natural gas um, is basically just cheaper. So uh, right now it's, it's kind of a technology that's there on hold. It's not really being pursued all that much to my knowledge because um, there are, are just cheaper ways of producing energy. And as, as many of you probably know, uh, it's getting to the point where renewable fuels uh, and electricity, uh, electric cells and, and uh, windmills, wind power, are, are probably going to make it so that, that this technology will never be coming into a lot of play. But it was very important during World War II for countries such as Germany that did not have access to hydrocarbons directly. Another problem, of course, is that, that uh, whatever you burn, it's producing carbon dioxide. So there are technologies that are being explored to take the carbon dioxide that's produced by burning fossil fuels and pumping it back underground, either using it, uh, pumping it back into coal beds, pumping it in saline aquifers, which are rocks that have a lot of porosity and contain saline water that can't be used for other purposes. And in some cases, people are exploring, I believe uh, at IC, people are exploring technologies to pump um, the, the carbon dioxide into reactive rocks that actually will react and form solid calcite minerals that will stay in an inert form underground permanently. But these technologies are, are still under development. And again, however you wanna uh, deal with them, they require a lot of energy to pursue. So you have to burn 25% more coal just to have the energy to do carbon capture and sequestration, which is not necessarily, not necessarily economical. Okay, we've basically talked about the first fossil fuel to be used, coal. Now let's turn our attention to the more recent usage, hydrocarbons. Uh, hydrocarbons really came into play in the mid-late 19th century um, with, the with the realization that, that uh, whale oil, which was being used for lamps, um, was running out. And so people began to thought, think that petroleum, rock oil, could be used as a substitute. And in the 1850s, um, the first oil well was drilled. Uh, gradually, of course, when, when uh, cars came along and then power plants came along, these became fuels that were, were used 
uh, perpetually for electricity generation and for transportation. So let's consider why, why are hydrocarbons so popular? Um, and then once we've, we've touched on that, we'll go back into trying to understand how they're formed and we'll make a, an important distinction, conventional versus unconventional hydrocarbons, because the reason we're still so dependent on them now is because of the technologies that were developed uh, to pursue unconventional hydrocarbons. Because if it weren't for that, we'd probably pass the peak of production of conventional fuels. And the result would be that we would be uh, having extremely expensive hydrocarbons right now, and there would be a greater rush to develop alternative fuels. We'll finish by talking about uh, high unconventionals and, and how they're obtained through the technology of fracking. <clears throat> so first of all, I mentioned again and again that oil and gas are hydrocarbons. They're basically molecules composed of carbon bonded to hydrogen. The character of a hydrocarbon depends on the viscosity of, of the fluid, and that just basically depends on the length of the hydrocarbon molecule. So if you have something like natural gas, they've got very small molecules, methane, ethane, propane. These have very small molecules. Go to gasoline, um, intermediate sized molecules, kerosene a bit bigger, heating oil a bit bigger, lubricating oil a bit bigger, and then solid hydrocarbons is tar, really large molecules. So effectively what you're seeing is the viscosity, whether it's gaseous, loose liquid, or very sticky and tarry, depends on the length of the hydrocarbons. Now, the reason that we like to use them so much is primarily because they have a high energy density. That's energy per unit weight. You can measure that in megajoules per kilogram. If you look at a chart, a lead acid battery like we have in the car, very low energy density. Alkaline, still pretty low. Lithium, a bit better, but even not even as good as wood. You get up to gasoline, you're up to quite a bit more. And of course, uranium, which is um, for fission in, in nuclear power plants is, is much, much greater. But of the non-nuclear technologies, gasoline clearly has the highest energy density. What that means is that you can, you can fuel your car pretty easily in about six minutes by loading up your, your tank with gasoline. And it's transportable, easily pumpable, uh, gives you a lot of range. Obviously, in the last few years, electricity is taking over to some extent. But uh, up until now, um, basically, gas-fueled cars were pretty much, and diesel-fueled trucks were pretty much the options. So as a consequence, up until very, very recently, and, and still actually, oil and gas, hydrocarbons, are the dominant energy resource of, of modern society. And it's often the use of it's measured in barrels. One barrel is about 42 gallons or 159 liters. Now, where does hydrocarbon come from? Well, we saw that coal came from buried plants. Hydrocarbon comes from buried plankton and algae. So if you imagine a body of water that's got lots of organic matter growing in it, along with clay, um, in, a given in, a, in an appropriate environment where there's a lot of sunlight, warm water, so there's a very productive and a lot of nutrients, so there's very production, high productivity of plankton, you'll create enough so that when it dies and settles out along with the clay, it forms an organic clay. And if that water down in the environment where it's accumulating is oxygen poor so it doesn't decay, it will get buried. So you end up with a buried layer of organic rich shale, or I should say at this stage, organic rich mud. Now, when it gets down to a, a temperature of, of uh, about 80 degrees, it starts undergoing chemical reactions that transform it. And that change Transform the rock, transforms the rock into shale and starts transforming the organic material first into kerogen, which is a kind of waxy substance. And then if it's heated even more, the kerogen converts into oil and gas. So temperature clearly is an important component. And that's why uh, we don't have oil forming at the surface of the earth. It forms underground. But if it gets too hot, then it gets destroyed. So there's really only a relatively narrow window in which oil and gas form. So that, that is called the oil window for oil and the gas window for gas. Now, some gas forms under biogenic conditions. Methane can be produced by um, metha methanogenic bacteria. But natural gas, when we think of the large supplies that are coming from underground, is formed at temperatures ranging from about 80 to up to 225 degrees. Oil forms at a narrow window up, up until about 150, 160 degrees or so. 
So if you get higher than that, then the organic chemicals break down and you get with you just get pure carbon, which forms a crystalline material called graphite. So in summary, you start with plankton, it gets converted into sediment. That sediment gets converted into sedimentary rock at the right temperature. It, that's the organic matter in that sedimentary rock turns into kerogen. And at even higher temperatures, the kerogen converts into oil, which can move. It's, it's a liquid or natural gas is a gas, and it can migrate through the pore space in rock. Now, at this point, let's make a distinction between conventional and unconventional hydrocarbons. Well, conventional hydrocarbons are ones that have low viscosity. They're able to flow easily. And they occur in permeable rock, meaning rock that's got a lot of open spaces in it, a lot of cracks, so it can migrate through the rock. And it, consequently, it can be pumped out of the ground relatively easily. That contrasts with unconventional hydrocarbons, which first of all have either high viscosity, meaning that they just won't flow, they're like tar, or they don't occur in permeable rock. So even if they have low viscosity, they can't be pumped easily because they can't migrate through the rock. So they can be only obtained by special technology. And we'll see what that technology is in a bit. Remember that viscosity is the ability to flow. Permeability is the degree to which the material containing the rock contains interconnected pores or cracks. So let's first look at how you form conventional oil supplies, which is what we've basically been reliant on since the discovery of oil or the first pumping of oil in the mid 19th century, the Civil War era, up until 10, 15 years ago. So oil forms from a source rock, which is the organic rich sale. It migrates into a reservoir rock. Oil is less dense than water, so it migrates upward. And that reservoir rock is a highly permeable rock and that it's held underground by a configuration of rocks called an oil trap. So, like I say, oil shale is the material that contains uh, um, organic material. Normal shale is just or inorganic material like clay or fine quartz. In an organic shale, there's organic material as well. So this is what a regular shale looks like on the left, just kind of light gray. This is what a source rock, a black shale looks like. It can be 25 to 75% organic matter derived from plankton that and algae that dropped out along with the clay. This is what a, a reservoir looks like. Um, this example is a sandstone, a porous sandstone. The quartz grains in a sandstone are these clear things, and the blue in, in between these quartz grains is all pore space, open, sp open space that in an aquifer can be filled with water, and an oil reservoir is filled with oil. So what happens is that oil forms, then maybe a fault forms or a big crack that allows the oil to migrate upward. It accumulates underground in an area called a seal. So here again, the oil formation, I got these upside down. The oil formation starts here, then it migrates up to form uh, an accumulation of oil underground. And that oil is held underground by a trap. In this case, I'm showing it by what's called an anticline, a fold, where there's a layer of impermeable rock like a gray shale that's overlying a reservoir rock, so it holds the oil and gas underground. Now, why did the oil rise? Well, just like salad dressing, oil is lighter than water, so if given an opportunity, it will try to get above the groundwater and will displace the groundwater and fill that area. Well, I, I had to cut out a lot of my discussion of the different places where, where uh, oil occurs because of time, but I'll do one example, which is the Middle East. Why is there so much conventional oil around the Persian Gulf? Well, geology tells us why. If we go back to a paleogeographic map of about 45 million years ago, um, the map is not that different from today, but Africa was a bit further south. Uh, Europe was assembling from a series of, of uh, smaller pieces. And this part of the world, which will become the Persian Gulf, was a shallow water environment in an equatorial region. So there was high productivity, a lot of nutrients, a lot of organic material was being deposited along with the shale. Then when Africa finally collided with Europe, it squeezed that area. So let's look at this part of the Persian Gulf right here in Southern Iran. It wrinkled up the layers of sedimentary rock to form lots and lots and lots of anticlines. Each one of these hills here is one of these anticlines, which is a arch-shaped fold or an arch-shaped 
layer where rock has been bent into, a, into an arch. And if the right rocks are present, the oil gets trapped underneath. You drill down into that anticline and you get a nice supply of conventional oil, which can be pumped out. So I mentioned that, that before 1859, oil was, it was used. I mean, people used oil for lubricating wagon wheels and things like that, but it wasn't used as a fuel. And people were able to get enough of it just plate where it bubbled out of the ground naturally. But in 1859, the first oil well was drilled. And after that, the rest is history, so to speak, uh, oil became the dominant source of, of uh, energy for society. Nowadays, the easy to find oil is gone and uh, people have to use much more complicated technologies. For example, to find oil underground, uh, often what's used is a, a truck called a vibrosized truck. This plate here is pressed against the ground. The truck causes it to vibrate. It sends low frequently sound waves into the earth, which bounce off the layers underground and are recorded by other trucks so that it creates effectively an ultrasound image or x-ray image of what's underground. And here's an anticline, so that might be a place to drill. Same thing can be done offshore. A lot of oil these days is from offshore mines or offshore wells, I should say. Uh, the difference is that instead of a truck, you got a boat. The boat uses a, hydro, uh, a, a bubble explosion that then bounces off the, the seafloor, bounces off layers under the seafloor and gets recorded by a hydrophone, which is a, a sound detector like that that's being dragged along behind the boat. The technology is so sophisticated now that you can actually create three-dimensional blocks of seismic reflection profiles, as they're called, underground and figure out exactly where the oil uh, is likely to be so that you have, these days, success rates of about 80% when drilling. Drilling is extremely expensive. It costs millions and millions and millions of dollars to drill. And so uh, oil companies don't want to drill unless they're really pretty certain about where the oil is underground. How do you drill? Well, conventional drilling, um, you had a vertical well. It had a pipe that was turning. At the head of the pipe, as you see on the right here, is a drilling head, which is basically a, a, a studded head with either very hard metal or, in some cases, industrial diamonds. As this drill head rotates, it grinds away the rock beneath. Now, to avoid the rock from just clogging up the whole system, high pressure mud is pumped down through the pipe, comes out through holes in the drill head, and then flushes the cuttings out with the rising drilling mud. Now, actually, the oil mud, the, the drilling mud is extremely important because not only does it flush out the cuttings, but it also cools the drill bit so it doesn't melt because friction otherwise would melt it. And also the weight of that drilling mud holds the hydrocarbons, which are under pressure, underground. It keeps them from blowing out of the well because if that happens, there's a gusher or a, a, a blowout and that's something to really avoid. Um, the old images of, of gushers coming out of the ground and the, and the drillers jumping up and down for joy, that's disastrous, both from an environmental region and an economical um, reason. And so anything that can be done to keep the, thing, the pressure up underground is done. That's uh, the, the Deepwater Horizon disaster of several, many years ago now um, was a consequence where they took the drilling mud out before they had finished the hole and the, the oil and gas under pressure blew out the whole thing, caught on fire and then uh, caused an oil spill that lasted for months. Once the, the drill, drilling is complete, you dr pull out the pipe, put in a casing, and then start pumping. This is a typical uh, drill pump. You can see these in central Illinois as well. It just goes up and down, up and down all day long, pulling up oil, putting it in storage tanks, or sending it off in pipes to where it gets processed. Uh, conventional wells, since they only drilled down vertically, meant that when you had an oil field, a large structure that had an oil reservoir underground, you have to have lots and lots and lots of these pipe pumps. And so you left behind quite a footprint on the ground. These days, a lot of drillings offshore using progressively more expensive and, and deeper technologies. Basically, I don't have time to go into the details, but the same general technology is taking place, but it's on a platform offshore. Conventional oil is, is not everywhere. In the US, uh, North America, it's mainly along the Gulf Coast used to be a little bit in Pennsylvania, a little bit in the Midwest, uh, out in the West and up in Canada, but it's not necessarily near where the consumers of oil occur anymore. So it's gotta be transported either by pipeline, like across Alaska, 
ore in gigantic tankers, super tankers, where it's taken to refineries, where effectively the oil is broken down. The crude oil comes in, it's heated up, and then basically in this, this, this distillation column, the heavier stuff stays at the bottom, the lighter weight molecules, the more volatile molecule, molecules go to the top, and there's a faucet at every different level. And depending on, on uh, what product is needed, they, they have most of it come out of whatever, uh, whatever faucet they want. That's actually why the price of, of oil at the pump fluctuates so much. Part of it is what the price of crude oil is, which depends on supply and demand and uh, the decisions of OPEC and other suppliers. But part of it is, is whether or not the refineries are set up to produce gasoline for the, the summer or heating oil for the winter. Um, because they, they can't convert these things very easily. So sometimes they're a little bit out of sync with what, what the seasons are. Okay, we've talked about conventional oil. Now let's talk about the concept of, of peak oil and why um, peak oil means that we were basically running out of conventional. And if it hadn't been for unconventional, we would already be probably further along and switching to renewable fuels. Well, because uh, industrializing countries increase their usage dramatically, even as industrialized countries are decreasing their use. Um, but the reserves, well, most of them are in the Middle East. And so elsewhere, like in North America, reserves of conventional fuels were being used up. A lot of it was being used. So that meant that actually way back um, decades ago, a guy named M. King Hubert developed the concept of Hubert's Peak which is that for a given oil field or even for a country, production would increase and increase up to a point until basically there wasn't the discovery rate decreased to less than the consumption rate and production would start to decrease. And the peak of that curve became known as Hubert's peak. Now in conventional oil, the peak of the oil supply worldwide was probably back in 2010 or so. The peak for the United States was back in 1970. Now, new sources were being discovered, but still the assumption was that our supply was gradually decreasing. So people thought of us as being in a very limited age of oil. Now we're probably in a, in a limited age of oil for other reasons, but not because we're running out of supplies at the moment. Um, and that age of oil really would have run from mid 19th century to about 2100, much shorter than the Iron Age or the Bronze Age in human history. But what happened and was the game changer in all of this was that people began to develop technologies to exploit three kinds of unconventional fuels, tar sands, oil shale, and shale gas. And I should say shale gas and shale oil. Tar sand is basically sand that contains very viscous oil, so it can't be pumped directly. Oil shale contains just carrageen, so it can't, cannot be pumped directly. Shale gas and shale oil contains non-viscous fuels, but in impermeable rock. So if you can somehow increase the permeability, you can get the stuff out of the ground. The key to the viability is the cost per barrel, and it's decreasing for as technologies improve. So let's look quickly at these. Oh, tar sand, not my favorite. I mean, a, a tar sand is in, in, uh, in Western Canada, the, you basically mine it by, by strip mining, leaving quite a big mess. Um, the trucks take it to a processing fact where it's factory where it's heated up and the oil at that point becomes less viscous so it can be separated from the sand and then refined. Oil shale, it's basically a solid. You have to mine it out of the ground in general um, and then process it the same way. Uh, it can be possible to, to take oil shale and heat it up in a kiln and, and get oil out of it. But in some cases, it's, it's uh, people who develop technologies for actually heating up oil shale or heating up tar sand underground with steam and then pumping it. But you can imagine it's very expensive and, uh, and, and uh, you know, difficult to use. Uh, natural gas is, is a bit easier. So people um, began to exploit natural gas more. Uh, natural gas usually occurs in association with conventional oil, but it's difficult to transport and expensive to transport. So mostly it's flared at the oil well. But the game changer was to develop uh, techniques to extract oil and gas directly from the source beds. Remember the source beds are shales, which have a high organic content. And if there's some way to get it directly out of those rocks, um, that would 
mean that you wouldn't have to look for reservoir rocks, you wouldn't have to worry about source rocks. You could just get it straight out of, of extensive horizontal layers of source rocks. So first of all, those rocks occur much more broadly. They're widespread throughout the world, including in places that are close to where the resources are being used. Uh, in the US, four, four or five major places, Appalachia, uh, Texas, North Dakota. Um, but in order to get this stuff out, two technologies had to be developed. First of all, directional drilling, and secondly, hydrofracturing. And I'm getting towards the end of what I'm talking about, but I kind of want to get through this stuff, sorry. First of all, directional drilling. In traditional drilling, remember you just went straight down in a vertical hole. Directional drilling has a movable head. And so the drill can drill at any angle. And that means that you can actually eventually drill a hole that's horizontal and you can stay within the shale layer that contains the oil for kilometers and kilometers and kilometers underground. So whereas a traditional vertical hole only intersects the, the source rock for a short distance, a directional hole can intersect that hole for many, many kilometers. Well, that's fine and dandy, except that it's still a source rock. It still has low permeability, so you still can't pump unless you increase the permeability. But it allows you to, to use one drill head to drill in many directions so that you don't have to have the conventional grid of, of conventional wells. That decreases the drilling cost substantially. Now, the other source that, that uh, came, uh, that comes into play is the process of hydrofracking. So hydrofracking is to solve the problem of how to increase permeability. To, the goal is to create new fractures and to open and extend pre-existing fractures to increase permeability. So that the, the gas that's locked into this low, or the oil that's locked into this low permeability rock can get into the oil well and be taken out of the ground. So here's the concept. You drill down, you have a horizontal well go this way, you have a horizontal go the well go that way, and then you fracture the rock. So now the, the gas and oil that's in that rock can go into the well and then go back up and be taken out of the ground. So how's it done? Well, let's look at what's happening where a new area is about to be fracked. And this process is known you know, publicly in general by the term fracking. So here's your horizontal drill hole. You put a, a, a balloon in called a packer, seals off the hole here, seals off the hole here, stick in a pipe, and then pump it with high pressure fluid. The high pressure fluid opens up cracks and propagates cracks. But that fluid is not pure water. It's got sand in it. So when the fluid is taken out, the sand props the hole, the cracks open, so they stay permeable, and then the gas could come out, go into the drill hole, and be taken out of the ground. But there are problems with this, as, as this audience probably knows. There are concerns about water contamination. There are concerns about triggering earthquakes. And then there are a huge number of social issues. I won't really have time to talk about those, but let's look at these two problems to start. So first of all, what is fracking fluid? It's not just pure water. It's a 90% water and 9.5% sand, but this last bit, this half percent, are chemicals that you don't necessarily want to drink. Um, oops. <laughs> Hang up my phone. Sorry about that. So um, you have to have diesel fuel to increase the viscosity so it can carry more sand. You want to have uh, rust inhibitor to keep the pipes from rusting. You want to have bactericide to kill bacteria. You want to put detergent in to make it slippery. Uh, antifreeze to keep it from freezing and causing rust. In other words, these are the chemicals that people are worried about. And so when you go to a, fra a fracking drill site, there are huge numbers of trucks carrying all these different chemicals and huge pumps that are drilling this stuff and pouring it underground. And then the stuff is coming out of the ground and being stored in a retention pond or a retention tank. So is contamination a problem? Well, it depends. Many people think that the fracking itself is the problem and it may be in some places, but a lot of times the fracking is happening so deep that the groundwater is salty. So first of all, it's not gonna rise because it's denser. And second of all, this is not groundwater that we're ever going to use for drinking or agriculture. So it's down there, but it's not necessarily a problem until groundwater flows carries it into someplace else. But there's a vertical part of the hole that carries it down deeper. And it's this part where there could be leakage into aquifers. 
And of course, the retention ponds and the handling at the surface can cause leakage from the surface. So there is a concern, a justifiable concern about leakage, not from the fracking, but from the other aspects of processing the fluid. Secondly, earthquakes. Well, it turns out that when you pump fluid underground at high pressure, it can induce seismicity. What, what's happening is you're increasing the pore pressure, effectively pushing the rock cracks apart and allows them to slip a little bit more easily. Now, again, it's not where the fracking is taking place that's the problem. It's that when you pump out the oil, a lot of groundwater, a lot of salty groundwater comes out with the oil. That salty water can't be dumped into rivers or, or, or lakes. So the only solution is to pump it back down underground into the, the reservoir rock that it came out of. But if you do that, it pushes the rock apart and generates, generates earthquakes. So in fact, in Oklahoma, when fracking began, the number of earthquakes increased exponentially. If you decrease the pressure that you pump at, you can stop the problem. But that wasn't being done because it would require drilling more holes, which is expensive. So the reason again, let's imagine that this is a fault, of a fracture on which slip can take place and an earthquake can, has, can cause. The, the stress caught necessary to cause sliding um, depends on the pore pressure. So if you increase the pore pressure, it pushes it apart and that can trigger an earthquake. Well, in any case, because of directional drilling and because of fracking, the amount of production of oil and gas has increased dramatically since about 2007, 2008. So if you view this bell-shaped curve as basically being Hubert's curve with the peak production of about 1970 or so, suddenly, Hubert's curve is out the window and there, there's a lot more hydrocarbons. So the upside of this, of course, is that it kept, has kept the cost of hydrocarbons cheap, but the downside is that it has inhibited the production of alternative energy. Burning natural gas uh, and, and, uh, is better than burning coal, but the processing and drilling and so forth does cause gas leakage. So right now there's still a bit of in lack of clarity as to whether or not uh, the carbon footprint of, of increased natural gas is really better or worse. So the elephant in the room, the production of carbon dioxide is still there because effectively what we're doing is we're taking huge amounts of carbon that have been stored for millions to hundreds of millions of years underground, sending it into the atmosphere by burning it, some of it gets absorbed by plants, some of it gets absorbed by rocks, some of it gets absorbed by sea, but not all of it, and the remainder is staying in the air. So I'll just summarize by saying that I, I, I obviously could talk a lot more about this in, in many other lectures, but to try to condense it into one lecture, I focused the discussion today on fossil fuels, why we use them, a little bit of their history, how they're produced, some of the issues associated with them, and then, of course, ending with the, with the ultimate problem, which is the carbon footprint um, and the climate change consequences of that, which still is there. So thanks very much. I'm going to take myself off of share and uh, answer any questions that you got. All right. So Professor, Professor Marshak, we do have a few questions. Um, and I'll read the first one uh, from Jonah Messenger. Biogas and upgraded biogas or renewable natural gas from methanogenic processes such as anaerobic digestion is, as you mentioned, another way to produce methane. I've heard fairly smart folks on energy say this gas production from AD, uh, anaerobic digestion, could only supply about 3% of our current gas demand. Have you seen the same? And does this come from literature that evaluates all potentially digestible organic waste, such as food production, ag waste, beyond traditionally digested dairy manure? Well, I think, prob uh, excellent question. I think the expert on this is, is uh, there are experts on this on campus um, and I'm not one of them, but my impression is that, that the, the big game changer in that is either developing ways to create vastly more algae in, in uh, warm environments, um, you know, in tanks because algae basically are producing lipids which then can be relatively easily converted into hydrocarbons or by using uh, perennial plants like switchgrass and other kinds of, of sources for, for uh, um, production of, of energy using areas that are, uh, that are not needed for other types of agriculture for the production of switchgrass. The, the problem I see is that, that uh, the current use of reliance on, on say, um, 
you know, sugar cane and, and corn, you know, the, the, the process is fairly uh, water intensive in terms of how it's being used. And um, it, it's not, it, the, the plants are not necessarily perennial. And so therefore it's not necessarily um, recycling the carbon back into the ground. So I think that, that I don't know about the specific numbers. So biogenic uh, production of energy is, is certainly a, a, a part of the future, um, but it will have to be reliant more on, on renewable types of materials such as, as uh, perennial plants and algae um, if it's gonna become uh, a dominant source. Like I say, there are, there are other folks on campus that know a lot more about that than I do. So sorry, I can't give a more complete answer. Thank you for answering that question. All right, we have one more that's in the Q and A right now. Um, and if anyone else has any questions, feel free to put them in there as well. Uh, this one says, thank you for your presentation. Could you please provide some more information about carbon sequestration or carbon capture? Okay, so, so uh, carbon sequestration and capture, capture, again, a technology that there's been a lot of work on on our campus, um, involves basically going to places where there's a, a relatively high concentration of carbon dioxide being produced, such as a power plant or an agricultural uh, facility like uh, ADM soybean processing plant or something like that, or a cement factory that's uh, burning limestone to produce lime and as a consequence carbon dioxide. And then basically capturing the effluent from these uh, plants, liquefying it, and then pumping it at high pressure underground. Now, um, the, the traditional or the more, uh, I, not so traditional really, but, but the way it's been done to a large extent so far in experimental processes is to pump it back down into either coal beds or into saline aquifers that have high porosity. Uh, there was a big experiment that was done a few years ago uh, in Decatur where, where uh, ADM factories were pumping CO2 back down underground. Um, the, the challenge with that is that it's not clear how long it will stay underground. That's because rocks have natural cracks and it could be that, that over centuries, it would seep back up into the atmosphere. And so in that regard, it could just be a temporary fix. There's debate about that, but um, that's one concern about that. Another technology that's being explored more is the possibility of reacting it with certain minerals, uh, pumping it into, into rock types, um, where it will react with the minerals in the rock type to produce calcite, which is a solid, and, and, and similar minerals like that. And if that's the case, then if you could pump it down into a material that contained a lot of that solid, uh, or a lot of those minerals, it would, it would end up staying underground in, in the solid form. But that technology is still really, really in its, in its earliest stages yet, and uh, is not clear um, you know, where that's gonna go yet. So right now, uh, carbon capture and sequestration does, you know, seems like a possibility, seems like there's, there's need for further exploration of it. Um, it's not in a position at the moment where it can solve a major uh, part of the, the carbon production. Part of it is because it's so expensive to do. Um, by one estimate, it would, you'd have to burn 25% more coal to power the carbon sequestration facility that would take the carbon from a coal burning power plant and stick it back underground. And so that would create all the additional problems of exposing more coal to air, causing more acid mine runoff, more acidification of groundwater, more acid, acid uh, rain, and, and so forth. So, you know, you're sort of solving one problem but creating others. Looks like we have time for, uh, we have two more questions in our Q&A, so we'll uh, try to get to those real quick, if that's okay. Sure. All right, fantastic. So this is a bit of a two-part question, so I could read them one after the other um, from Andy Robinson. Uh, does coal come from the same algae that you mentioned with oil or from trees and cellulose? Why does coal all come from a similar geological age? Um, and the second part of this is also what is the relative ratio of carbon captured in limestone versus coal and oil? Okay, so so um, the first question is, is coal comes strictly from, from uh, plant matter? So uh, coal is a solid material. It's basically a sedimentary rock that forms in environments where you had ex uh, high growth of, of plant matter. And also you had an environment of, of accumulation of the plant matter that's anoxic. So for example, an anoxic swamp is a great place for, for collecting the material 
where coal forms because the plant matter dies, uh, gets submerged, and then gets buried before it ever has a chance to, to decay completely. Um, the coal supplies in the United States uh, and in many parts of the world are mostly Carboniferous. There are actually two age ranges, Carboniferous and also uh, Cretaceous. The Carboniferous stuff, which is what's underneath Illinois, formed because in the Carboniferous time, uh, Illinois and the rest of North America was in an equatorial environment where there was uh, warm temperatures, good for, for plant growth. And also, um, the, the, we were sort of near the edge of a shallow sea. Sea level was particularly high and it washed over and covered a large area of the continent. Water tables were high because climate was a lot wetter. And the result was that the, the sort of anoxic swamps that could accumulate um, coal were able to exist. You can't get coal earlier, uh, much earlier in geologic time because there weren't woody plants. Obviously, you couldn't get coal until plants had evolved. And uh, in more recent times, we just don't have the environments in, say, North America for, for coal to form. There are environments elsewhere in the world, uh, maybe like the Amazon and so forth, where, where future coal might be accumulating. Uh, the coal in, 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 uh, in, um, in Wyoming is Cretaceous. It's a different environment. It was a lake environment. It's part of the reason it has no sulfur. And that's why people prefer to burn uh, Wyoming coal than to Illinois coal, is because you have less sulfur to deal with. Uh, remind me what the second part of the question was. Uh, the second part of the question. Uh, the relative ratio of carbon captured in limestone versus coal and oil. Well, right now, um, the so limestone is, is composed of the mineral calcite, CaCO3. And when you produce cement, you take crushed up limestone, heat it in a kiln, and that roasting converts the CaCO3 in, into CaO, which is lime, and CO2, which is carbon dioxide gas. The amount of CO2 coming from um, limestone production or cement production, I believe is about 8% of global toll. Much more comes from fossil fuel burning. So uh, the carbon capture and sequestration has been more focused on, on uh, fossil fuel production plants uh, or fossil fuel burning plants or alternatively on agricultural environments where, where uh, like soybean production, where there's a, a fairly concentrated production of, of CO2. Hasn't really been done so much yet, as far as I know, in, in, uh, in the situation of, of uh, cement production. But um, the amount of cement that's being used, especially in the industrializ industrializing countries like China and India, is just you know, immense. And so cement production has actually contributed quite a bit of greenhouse gas that we do need to worry about. Well, that's fantastic. And I would just like to, on behalf of Gillen Wood, our uh, Associate Director for Education and Outreach, and all of our directors uh, at IC, just thank you again for uh, some amazingly informative lectures. Uh, Professor Marshak, we uh, can't thank you enough for this. Uh, just, I, I mean, it's a lot to think about. It's, it's, it's <laughs> uh, almost hard to process. And, and we just think about where humanity has come and how much we're using of what was already part of this earth before we ever got here. And, you know, it gives us a lot to think about as far as, uh, as moving ahead and what future generations will have remaining, uh, just based on what we're, what we are taking from this earth every day and, and doing things with and, and building with and, and, and mining for uh, precious purposes as well as just burning and uh, kind of scary, but it, it uh, just really informative and we really appreciate your time in doing this. Um, we've had, uh, we had a high of about 48 people today. Uh, we had in the 40s and the, at the second lecture and over 100 people at the first lecture. So really, really exciting um, to have people learn about this. I know we had a class at uni high that first week as well, which was just really exciting to see. So uh, again, thank you so much on behalf of IC. We really appreciate this. And I believe this will end our lecture for today. Well, thanks very much. See you later. <laughs>